Welcome to the Global Discussion, discussions with creatives, leaders and thinkers. My name's Simon Hodgkins. Today, it's an absolute pleasure to be joined by Stephen Kinsler. Stephen, you're very welcome to the podcast. Let's begin by asking you to introduce yourself. Tell us all about this wonderful world of economics and everything you're involved in. So over to you, Stephen. Well, thanks very much for having me, Simon. I really appreciate it. And, and you know, hello to everybody listening. Um, so I'm Stephen Kinsella. I'm Professor of Economics at the University of Limerick in Ireland. Um, I'm also a co-director of a new program called Immersive Software Engineering, which uh, is a transformational new way of learning computer science. Um, I write uh, books and articles all the time, and I, I write for the I write journal articles and, and books, etc., for for academic audiences. But I also spend uh, a tremendous amount of my time writing for the general audience. Uh, a general audience is particularly for a, a publication called The Currency, where I'm the chief economics writer. And um, in addition to all that, I, uh, I run a number of research centers, and I'm also the head of a uh, an academic department, which is. Uh, um, in the academic world, it's sort of it's sort of middle management kind of thing. Um, so it's interesting uh, and fun, and it's a privilege to have these roles, and it's it's just fun to be able to do this stuff. Um, and probably the best thing about my job is I get to think deeply about things I care about, and then I write about them. And then what what happens is the deeper the thought, the longer it takes to express it. So for example, um, I'm working on a paper now with a colleague uh, it, that we started writing three years ago, but it's a it's about the deep structure of the Irish economy. Um, and I, I this t today I wrote a piece um, for the currency talking about commercial property because some of the research that I had read for that paper gave me to understand that there is potentially a really serious problem with um, um, commercial property here. Now you might want to go into that or not, I, I don't know, but it's just a good example of like how these um, layers of sort of intellectual silt kind of move over one another. And it's a very interesting um, job to have because the job is whatever you want it to be. If you want to be a really good teacher, you can be a really good teacher. And if you want to do nothing but research, you can do that. And if you want to do the much more portfolio version of the job, the one that I do, uh, you can do that too. And um, the job kind of stretches uh, within certain constraints. You, you have to teach your classes, but within certain constraints, the job uh, uh, flexes. So yeah, I'm, I'm, um, I'm, uh, I'm a creature of, of, of deep privilege that knows exactly how lucky it is, if that makes any sense. Well, look, it's always good to catch up with a professor of economics, because um, I've certainly got some questions for you today uh, that will help our international audience. And of course, through your uh, writing and musings and, and uh, insights through your chief uh, economics writer at the currency that you mentioned. And let, let's maybe touch on something that you've raised there, because I did read the uh, commercial property piece. Um, and I think people around the world, obviously, we, we're We've come through this pandemic time. We've seen some companies do really well during the pandemic. We've seen other industries decimated. We've seen a lot of home working going on. We've seen a lot of remote working and nomadic working. We've seen some corporate companies trying to corral people back to the office. We've seen technology layoffs. We've seen stock markets recover. Uh, we've seen war and trouble around the world. There's an awful lot going on, and I'm very interested in this. Where do where do, where does this end up? Um, do we need all this office stock that's out there? I'm reading reports that there's more and more offices becoming uh, available. There's more up for lease. There's a rent challenge. There, and not just in Ireland. I mean, globally, this is not just unique to the island of Ireland. It's it's happening everywhere. Um, and I'd be really interested, maybe, if you want to unpack that topic a bit, because you wrote a fascinating piece, and I'm sure you have some deep thoughts and insights on this. So over to you on that one. Well, well I guess the first thing to, to talk about is what COVID taught us, right? So COVID taught us that we um, we have these trends that are affecting us, and all COVID did was like really accelerate them. So we were always going to go remote once broadband connectivity and once you know, companies like Zoom existed, remote work was going to happen. There, there, there's no 
there's no situation in which everyone going into the office all the time is 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 doable in the modern world. It's just not, um, and so COVID just accelerated that. Um, what it did though was destroy the idea that you can't do your job from home. Okay, so so no employer can turn around and go, oh, you can't possibly you know, do this from home. If you can, if you can work from home one day a week, you can probably work from home five days a week. It's just really a question of degree. Um, and for the kind of services jobs that, that, that make up the modern, modern developed economies, uh, you can work from home all the time if you feel like it. Now, the, that creates a number of challenges, uh, not the least of which is uh, that demand for residential space will rise because people want to have home offices and stuff and demand for commercial space will fall. Um, because people, you know, no employer is going to pay for 100% of space when they only need 40% over the longer term, right? Uh, that's one problem. The other problem is that um, Nicholas Bloom from Stanford and others have shown that remote work is, is associated with a 10% decrease in labor productivity. So 100% remote is actually less productive than 100% in, pl in place for the same kind of jobs. Um, and that's the first major research coming out to show that. So all things being equal, if your wage is conditional on your productivity, you should be earning less for being at home, right? So that's that's one problem. And we, we have seen a series of moves where, um, and you use the phrase digital nomads, where people were earning San Francisco wages, but living in like Mexico and living like Kings and, you know, and, and these kinds of things um, where people were arbitraging location based on salary and i think all that kind of stuff is gonna is gonna end um uh, just because it's it, it, it's just the last uh, vestiges of the covid bubble but the real question then is if you assume we live in a world where you only use let's say 70 percent of the commercial real estate in 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 this in a city center what are the effects of that well the first is that obviously you have to find some use for this stuff and uh, that's not being used um you you will also have the commercial property companies that are that make up the uh, uh, the landlords here. You'll have some of them going bust, and then you'll also have a problem of um, ideas. And this is sort of the the point of my piece. So uh, what I started doing was because I, I was reading a lot about the the future of the city. Um, I started reading what 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 architectural theorists think about what the future of the city could be. And it basically boils down to kind of three versions. So I read about 10 papers on it over the last kind of two weeks and they boil down to three versions. So one is like the city as garden, right? So like a sustainability hub. So you convert the commercial space into residential, you live there, but like the city itself, there aren't any roads, it's all grass. And, you know, it's, it's sort of a beautiful um, space. It looks a lot like um, Afro futuristic architecture. Like, do you remember the, uh, the city of Wakanda? In Marvel, that's what you know Dublin might look like, or or London, or whatever, right? So that's one version. Um, the other version is is the city as uh, innovation hub, where you basically get a bunch of startups, a, bu a bunch of uh, uh, a bunch of startups, a bunch of scale ups, and you put them into these uh, uh, former commercial spaces, and you essentially say, "I'll give you this for free, and when you exit the company, you give me a you give me a slice, right?" Um, you massively densify. The startup ecosystems around the country so you'll only have one in say dublin or whatever and and that's good for ideas it's good for moving things on um the third version is is really interesting and it's it's the it's the city as cultural hub so you essentially turn these resident uh, formal commercial spaces into a mix of commercial uh, sorry a mix of residential and uh cultural space so the city is venue is this idea. I, I like all three. I mean, there are various versions of middle-class utopia, right? You know, I'd, I'd like a garden. I'd like a club. I'd like a concert hall. You know, I'd like a startup. Hub. It's very middle-class in all fairness, right? Um, <clears throat> but on the other side, um, on the other side, there's a, uh, there, there's, there's a question about what to do. And we actually know what happens when, when commercial property prices collapse, because it happened in the 80s in Berlin and New York. It happened in the 90s in Malaysia. It happened in the, in the 2010s. So we know what happens. Basically, the businesses vacate and the arts and culture and startups and people who don't have any money but who have lots of ideas fill the space. And then they use the space to promote themselves and their ideas and so forth. And then the market comes back and then they kick all those people out. Right, so it's like how to stop the market-based reaction of that and make it kind of work in a specific way, you know? Um, so yeah, it's really cool. 
it's really it, the, it's really cool. Now, the all of these middle class fantasies, they, they don't have to deal with balance sheets. OK, so the commercial reality of this is that these companies have borrowed money to build these buildings and they're renting out the buildings to pay off the loans in a world where the rent isn't there. The loans fall due. The banks get in trouble. The banks get bailed out. Right. By who? The government. So you, the taxpayer, bail these people out eventually. That's a bad situation unless there's a plan for what to do with it, which is what I was calling for in the piece. A lot of the time, you know, you could summarize like 80% of my pieces by saying we should probably think longer term, guys. And um, the short term for things like commercial and residential is 20 to 30 years, longer term, 50 to 100. You know, I've asked, I've, go, I've started going around asking colleagues, what do you think Ireland's going to look like in 2100? And it's an interesting question. And you could, you, could, you, you could ask the same question of London or New York. Like, why are we talking about 2050? 2050 is a blink away, right? We, we, as if it's far away. You know, it's, it's not. It's, 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 it, we, we, we will, we will, it will pass us by with extraordinary speed. Um, 2100 is the, is the target to shoot for in my book. Um, and, and, and when we think about these things, the key thing that I'm always telling people is have more ambition, right? We, we lack, if we lack anything in, in the world these days, it's, it's ambition. We lack ambition. We, pump, we, we take our most ambitious people and we, we say, do a startup, do a scale up, do a, you know, do an L to try, try, try to try to be the next Collison brothers or whatever. And that, that's fine. And there's nothing wrong with that. But we don't say to, to our most ambitious people, like, how would you like to build the biggest power plant in the history of the state? How would you like to have your legacy be written in concrete for two centuries? You don't say that. But the people uh, uh, in Ardna Krusha, which is a, a hydroelectric power plant near Limerick, uh, where, where, where I live, um, they decided to do that. And when the government... In, spent 25 million a year. That was a total spending of the Irish government. These guys spent five of it on a big hydroelectric dam that produced 86 megawatts of power when it was built. It produced all the renewable, all the power that the country needed at the time for nearly 20 years. And they, we did that while still a developing country. Now we're one of the richest countries in the world. Why can't we do it? I find that we... We lack ambition. And the funny thing about ambition, Simon, as you know, because I've I listened to your podcast, you talk to some very ambitious people. Ambition is free. Ambition's free. You know, ambition's free. Bravery is free, right? Risk is not free. Risk is not free. But bravery Very is, true. you know, and I'm struck by that. But anyway, that's the rant over. Uh, um, I, have, I have another rant for next week. <laughs> But, you know, thank you for the insights. Uh, and it's extremely useful to hear your perspectives on it. I love the question about, you know, uh, not thinking short term, but thinking long term. Um, and that really that really made me stop and think a little bit because it is there's almost that cyclical nature or that trend, if you like, that just keeps happening, that pattern. It's that boom and bust pattern. And what does it look like in the future? And also your thoughts about COVID and how it's, it's sort of proven the model one way, but it, it it's almost reinforced the question, where do we go from here? And the thing I wanted to maybe just ask you about is, I'm sure you're keeping an eye on things that are happening out in the Middle East, for example. They seem to be building a whole new city in a very vertical straight line uh, that seems very, very different. Um, we know uh, in, on the island of Ireland, we have done pretty good at... Uh, inwardly in attracting investment into the country with huge global multinational companies building headquarters and plants and everything else but then you you run out of housing and you run out of affordable housing and it's it's that we're not the only city in the world struggling with that phenomenon mm -hmm. it's very difficult um so do we you know do we repurpose a lot of this stock or is it is it is it a much deeper question is it or maybe there's some short term measures we can take here but ultimately, we need a complete rethink. If, if you clicked your fingers and made me prime minister, dictator, whatever, what I would do is I would quintuple the engineering budgets of the universities. And I would give a scholarship to any student that wished to study engineering. 
of any kind, not just software, any kind of engineering. I would create a new institution. And this institution would be responsible for the delivery of infrastructure programs over decades. And I would say to this institution, come rain, come shine, boom, bust, bust, boom, whatever. We're giving you two billion a year. That sounds like a lot of money. It's not. Um, uh, the, the state will spend an extra 14 billion a year doing stuff this year. The difference between that and what we have now is some, some years you've got loads of money for capital. Like when I say capital spending, I mean like trains and hospitals and roads and stuff. Some days you've got loads of money and then you have to spend it right away. And some years you've nothing. And so the nothing gets built. What you need is steady, steady, steady money every single year, two billion quid. You're building trains, you're building hospitals, you're building schools. You're not doing it quickly, right? but you are doing it expertly. And this is where the engineers come in. You have a core of engineers that are seconded by the state. They're paid bloody well to stay there. We lionize them. We love them. We love them the way the Finns love teachers, right? It's like my son, my daughter, the amazing Irish infrastructure engineer, right? It's that kind of like, you give it a cool social cachet. And what you do over a 20 year period is you insulate the capital stock of the country from booms and busts. That has three major effects. The first is it allows us to cope with climate change much more readily. In Ireland, we've, uh, we've got a big problem in that um, for us, climate change means more rain, which means more flooding, which means flood damage. And in order to really stop that, you need to basically build big ass walls, right? There's other, there's more complicated ways of doing it. My friends, the environmental engineers give out to me when I say this, but basically you're building walls. Um, the second thing these people will be able to do is they will be able to plan and execute very large capital programs, absent consultants, absent outside expertise. They'll do it themselves. And the, the, what that does is that stops the idea of, well, I just get paid a percentage anyway. So if the cost goes up, I get paid more. So it deprives everyone of that incentive by keeping the expertise within the state in-house. You actually have uh, that capacity to really develop over time. But the third thing, which is maybe, maybe the most important, is by connecting this institution, this infrastructural institution, back to the universities, you have research money coming in that has people going, oh, there's money to think about new materials for construction. Cool, I'll do that. Because academics respond to where the money is, like everyone else. Right? If the money's in silicon and nanotechnology, they'll do that. And if the money's in quantum computing, they'll do that. If the money's in new materials, they'll do that. And so if it's the case that we have a, a, a big ball of money attached to a big ball of expertise that's rolling out over decades, that's relatively independent of political processes, what you'll end up having is amazing infrastructure. And where do you see this? You see this in cost per kilometer of things like subways. The best subways, the cheapest and best, so the, they're both the cheapest and the best subways in the world are in Italy um, uh, because they have a giant infrastructural commission that just does railways, but then now it does roads and it's gonna do canals, you know? And so the thing about expertise is expertise scales. It's something very few people understand is that the world's best trauma surgeon is way better than five mediocre trauma surgeons. Yeah, because that ex but the expertise scales because they're able to tell other people how to do it. So you want to be near these peak personalities, these peak levels of, of, of engineering excellence. And that's kind of cool, you know? And um, by the way, that's also the same expertise that can build a subway, can build an offshore power rig. So instead of sending billions of euros to Denmark to get Danish people to build our offshore wind turbines. We just build it ourselves. That's yeah. not a bad idea. Yeah, interesting thoughts there and uh, certainly making me think a lot. Um, because when, when I look at the reality on the ground, it's very different. We try to build a hospital, it takes us four times as long and 10 times the cost that we thought it was going to mm -hmm. do. We still don't have a rail link to the main airport in the capital city. There's lots of things that maybe haven't been given that expertise, execution. Um, and it, I just want to touch on something you said as well, though, maybe as part of that, th that thought process, that 
you said earlier that you'd been working on this paper document thought for three years now. And to many people listening or watching to this, that would just seem really, really strange because we live in this world of content now, produce it now, get it out there, mm. fast media. Uh, we've got AI crawling all over everything and producing mediocre content left, right and center. Um, whereas you're sort of, the advocacy here is, well, let's build, you know, if we if we can build and surround these experts, we can think maybe a bit deeper, a bit longer, have that expertise almost sort of propagate uh, into other areas. Um, that helps an awful lot, doesn't it, with this longer term success strategy for not just the country, but, um, you know, for every citizen. Um, yeah, I would agree with you. I think I think that there is like, if if you're worried about ChatGPT taking your job, you're not thinking deeply enough about it, right? AI is not going to take a job. It's going to take the tasks in your job. If your job is mostly mundane tasks, get another job, right? Just your life is temporary and precious. Get another job, you know? Um, there are many of them out there. Unemployment is less than 3% or less than 4% in this country right now. You, there are other jobs out there that will that will be more fulfilling. What AI will do is, I think AI is going to do two, two things. It's going to change the nature of content production. And it will mean that things like blogs essentially become like confetti. It will mean that there's there will be a disproportionate reward to specialization and depth. Um, and so, so the currency is basically depth. That's what it's for. We only publish three stories a day. Um, and, you know, the average thing that I write is 2000 words, you know, it's typically festooned with academic references. I try to make it as accessible as possible. I rewrite it several times so that's, it's less no noodly. Um, but every so often there's an equation and, you know, there'll always be a graph. There'll always be evidence of what I'm talking about kind of thing, but the, the, there is a market for depth out there. Um, and it is perhaps the only market that survives something where it where being a generalist general technologist like that is the kind of thing that will get eaten away by um by ai and, and chat gbt what will stay is deep expertise and critical thinking and in particular the ability to specialize beyond the ai right i think that's 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 a version of the world that I could see happening that is is both compelling and useful. Like, like think about ATMs, you know? ATMs took away the drudgery of having to go up and get money out of the bank. And it made, and bank tellers actually increased in number after the ATM in, uh, was introduced. Now, we don't use ATMs at all. Like, I haven't used cash, like paper cash, for months. Like, I, I can't actually remember the last time I used it. I'm not being funny. I, I don't have a wallet. I don't carry one with me anymore. I just have my phone, you know? Um, if I lost my phone, I'd be truly fecked. But, but for many reasons. But what is certainly true is that um, we still have a bank. People still go into banks. They still want a bank. You know, when you go for a mortgage, you don't apply online for these things. You go into them, you know. So there are moments where you need to talk to somebody in a bank. But honestly, um, these these tasks are being sort of moved away and that's not a bad thing. Um, the really interesting question for me is how do you harness ambition to action? So for example, um, there's, there's, there's loads of fellas with ideas, loads of ideas. People have ideas, you know, Bob has ideas, Jane has ideas, we all have ideas. Um, but very few people can make those ideas real. Very few. I mean, it's not even a percent of a percent. It strikes me that the upside of going from a percent of a percent to a percent is an order of magnitude, right? It's the difference from going from 100 to 1,000. It's a massive increase, right? You, and if you just think about that for a second, taking people who... They want to do something. They don't know what it is. They're restless. But they can't make anything because we're not training them to make things. Yeah? If you train people in software engineering, civil engineering, 
bioscience, loads of other stuff. They can make things. Bioscientists can make vaccines. They're definitely going to need them. Pandemics and climate change go hand in hand. So in that world where we're making more people who can make things, the real problem that we have is we won't have enough people who can sell things. Mm. And we don't actually teach people how to sell things either. So there's so, my point there is there's so much upside. There's so many cool things you could do, right? It's so incredibly exciting to think about a future where instead of pumping out loads of people who, who out of their education and training experience now need to be trained and need to be educated, if you pump them out a little bit earlier, the confidence and the ability and the skills to actually do stuff and then some other people who can make stuff and then some other people who can sell stuff. The world's your oyster. We're flying, you know? And, and it's not a complicated vision of the world. I'm not describing like a sky hook here, yeah. right? I, I wanted to ask you though on, yeah. on that, if I can, Stephen. Please do. Like we're, we're sort of discussing it, sort of looking this way, saying this is what we need kind of thing. What about obviously being a professor at the university and all the economic writing and insights that you provide through the currency and, and your investments and the technology areas that you're involved in? Mm -hmm. If you were starting today, you know, if you were enrolling in college or university today for the first time, is there any sort of advice or what would you do differently? Or what what do we say to people who want to get on this sort of train of thought that you, you're sharing with us here today? What What's the best advice for those people? Um, go one of two ways. Pick the most technical thing that you can do, engineering, science, right? Or if that's if, that how, if that's how you're wired, go hard at it. Or if you're into the arts, social sciences, get into that hard. Because people who can think critically are going to be vitally important. I've come across lots of technologists that have never, literally never read a book. And so they, they're totally ignorant of history. They're totally ignorant of the mistakes they might make. They're also congenitally optimistic and boostery. And that's a good thing. It biases them for optimism. But there are moments where technology needs to be reined in. And there are moments where a historical perspective is very, very useful. And actually, it's almost better if the people who don't use the technologies are the people in charge, right? Because they see the downsides of them. And so you, you, so you need this playoff. I think it's it's where we get these kind of like, oh, I'm not sure what I want kind of degrees. Then just don't go to college. You know, it's, it's not worth it. You're wasting your time. You should come out of college with either a point direction or absolutely none. The idea of like, oh, I vaguely want to do business or oh, I vaguely want to do art or vaguely want to do this. No. Go out laser focused or I'm not sure what I want. I'm off. I'm going to try a hundred things. It's, it's always in the adjacent possible that you'll find it. So for me, for me personally, um, I would probably go back. I would probably go back and I would probably study computer science. Um, probably. Uh, now, maybe, maybe I, 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 I really enjoy reading. I enjoy writing. So maybe I would have done English, but, but um, uh I I can tell you that that's what I would be advising any any young person. Yeah. Uh, and then the other thing is maybe don't think about third level as the first place to go. Maybe what you want to do is you want to learn by doing. Learning by doing is the best way to learn. It's also the most painful way to learn, by the way. <laughs> um, but that's maybe why it's the best. Joining a company and starting up starting something small is a really, really, really good thing to do. Having that ability to do things is a really, really, really good thing to do. You know? Um, yeah. I do. I do think that there's, there's just something there. Sam, there's something there. And I wonder would my life have been different if I'd been given the opportunity to some of these, the kids in the immersive software engineering degree, like they have five different paid work placements in places like Stripe and Amazon things like yeah. that but we're also supporting them to develop their own companies right yeah it's it, it is yeah. a it is a very different i suppose um 
way today, not only is the way of working changing that we've talked about earlier, but the type of disciplines, the type of skills, whether it's deep in the technology or deep in the, the arts and culture type of um, uh, areas. Uh, and I suppose those things that make us human, that make us able to think, mm. make us able to do that critical thinking that you're sort of referring to, um, I, I think that helps breed that sort of expertise we were touching on earlier. Um, now, with with everything that you're looking at from your vantage point, because you're involved in a lot of things, right? You're a busy guy. What do you love about what you do now? I mean, what what do you enjoy? Um, so right now, weirdly, I am I really enjoy uh, administering an academic department <laughs> uh, because it's 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 a it's a big department. It's growing. There's lots of positive stuff going on, but I get to help lots of people, lots of junior staff. Um, I get to work with my colleagues, and I'm enjoying that. I mean, academic administration is not without its frustrations, but a weekly basis, I'm tearing my hair out. On a monthly basis, I'm delighted. Um, so I, I, I see genuine, genuine, lasting progress that will outlast my time in this in this in this role because yeah. it's a five year job and I'm two and a half years into it, or yeah, nearly two years into it actually. Um, so that's important. the The other thing I'm I'm really enjoying is I, I started drafting the next book, so I'm starting to think on various chapters of that and how it might work and how it might sit there so that's kind of cool and that those all everything like that i've written i've written essentially on public transport on planes on trains on buses i started i was on a bus for four hours today up and down to dublin and i uh, knocked out a yeah i knocked out a pretty nice one so i i like the freedom to just go i'm gonna do this now and i do it and because it's where your energy is at at the moment you, you push your energy into that set of ideas and sure enough it it kind of comes out okay you know um I, I think what i've learned about myself in a without getting excessively freudian about it is i am i am quite good at certain things and i'm really bad at others and I, i'm lucky that i have a bunch of people who help me with the stuff i'm really bad at um, and I'm led away to do the things I'm good at. And I have the path to learning new things. So next year, I'm, I'm going to go to um, Harvard for a while to learn about this new, um, there's a new course called uh, Leading Organizational Change. And it's about how, how organizations improve, right? And uh, it's really cool to think about these, those ideas and that like they're the top people in the world and they, you can, and I'm, I'm going to go there as a student and I'm going to, you know, um, sit in the class and just do my best to, to absorb as much as I can. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and yeah, like the best thing about this job is that you never stop learning. Um, yeah. 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 Well, it's also that, pretty sounds, well that sounds good. And I, I suppose anybody who's got a new book on the go, uh, that's great. I like what you talked about as about the energy as well. I was actually talking to an author yesterday who's oh, yeah? currently writing, I think their third book. And they said something similar to me that kind of, I was asking them about how they sort of go about planning and the targets for the book and how do they sort of structure it. And they said, well, it, it's kind of roughly going to come out here. And I kind of do it when the, the moment takes me and I have the yeah. energy behind it and I'm passionate about it. And that's when the best stuff kind yeah. of pours out of me. And it's very similar to what you're saying there in terms of whether it's grabbing those four hours on a commute up and down to the city or, or wherever it is. Yeah. Um, we look forward to receiving that. Before we run out of time, there's a couple of things I want to squeeze in, though, Stephen. Uh, one is, is there anything that we haven't touched on here today or maybe something that you want to expand on that you could leave our audience with as sort of like a final thoughts or some wrap-ups? And secondly, and importantly, uh, I also want you to maybe, if people want to reach out, find out more about the work that you do, the books that you do, uh, the currency, things like that, where's the best place for us to point people to on this episode? So the first question is, is something for people who are listening to this to ponder. And so what I would ask everyone to do as a piece of homework is on your phone or on a piece of paper or whatever, write down what you would like to see in Ireland or wherever you're living in 2100. So what do you want to see? Is it free power? Is it heads in jars? 
is a you know robot apocalypse like what do you like, what do you want to see like like what is the world that you want to see that you will likely not see okay will likely not see this you and i simon you're a young looking dude but i don't think we're going to make it my dad my man we're not so uh it, what's the world you want to see that you will never see right that's a cool idea because it gets you beyond the quotidian that's important um, answers on a postcard too. Um, if you go on LinkedIn, you uh, if you Google me, uh, Stephen Kinsella on LinkedIn, you'll find me. I'm on Stephen Kinsella at Twitter. And then I have my own website, but I don't do the common thing anymore because life's too short. So yeah, find me there. Uh, and you can learn more about the currency. It's thecurrency.news. Um, that's, that's all of my articles for the last four years have been there. Um, or you can check out... Um, uh, there's one other thing. Oh yeah, the, the immersive software engineering page, software-engineering.ie. There's a there's some amazing stuff up there, including uh, what what our students are doing now, the ones that are out on placement. It's um, it's just it's, it's actually inspiring. So I'm like, I mean, you really would be like, you'd be. It's hard to be bored when you're surrounded by people like this. Um, and to be honest, I'm never bored, and that's uh, that's maybe the best thing I can say. Well, that's fantastic. And it, it brings us nicely uh, to the end of this episode today of the global discussion. So I'd like to thank everybody who's taken the time uh, to be here with Stephen and I uh, to catch up on this episode. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Make sure that you follow, like, subscribe, do everything I need you to do to help support the global discussion. And of course, go and check out all the great writing that Stephen Kinsler has there on the currency and also check out everything in the academia world and keep an eye out for that new book of his. It's going to be a good one. But thank you so much indeed, Stephen. It's been a pleasure to catch up with you today again. Pleasure. Thanks a lot.